synoptic gospels. That means the contents of the three books are very similar and they follow the same outline. Where when you get to the Gospel of John, very different. Uh, a different, different outline, different beginning and ending, uh, different stories, different style of tell, telling the st story of the Gospel, <clears throat> much more narrative style. And so, very, very different. But these three are similar. We're going to start with Matthew. And there's, a, you know, of course, a, a debate over which is written next, Matthew or Luke. Uh, no one knows for sure. And uh, the, the, the fact is, is that they're probably written very closely together. I would date both of them sometime close to AD 70. The temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. And I think all three of the Gospels were written before the destruction of the temple because all three of them contain some prophetic material about the destruction of the temple and about uh, the Romans coming into Jerusalem. And so if you believe in pre uh, predictive prophecy, there's no problem believing that all three Gospels could have been written before uh, the temple was destroyed in A.D. 70. So we'll take a look at that in just a little bit. As we go into Matthew, we're just going to head right into some of these questions that you have on your basic outline. And again, there is the question of authorship. With all of these Gospels, it doesn't, the, the title at the beginning, the Gospel according to Matthew, that's not on the original text. It's not on any of the original text. And so you have to go outside of the text itself to try to figure, okay, who wrote this book? And so you have to look at early church history and what the early church fathers said. Again, Papias, this time writing around AD 130, says Matthew composed the Logia. Logia is the sayings or the discourse of uh, Jesus in the Hebrew tongue. So he's actually saying that the Gospel of Matthew was originally composed in Hebrew uh, and follow the sayings of Jesus in Hebrew. Irenaeus, who's writing around 2, 202, says Matthew also issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect. So again, he says that Matthew was written uh, in Hebrew uh, with while Peter and Paul were preaching at Rome and laying the foundations of the church. So both attribute this gospel to Matthew, a disciple of Jesus. So unlike John Mark, Matthew actually was a part of the apostles, and so he followed Jesus around. And uh, maybe that's part of the reason that you have major discourse sections in Matthew is because Matthew was there. Matthew heard what he said. Matthew also was a tax collector. Uh, Matthew was educated. Matthew could uh, write and understand several different languages. And it might be that he simply made notes as Jesus was talking and maybe actually just transcribed the different lessons of Jesus. Chances are that Jesus didn't just do the Sermon on the Mount once. I mean, that's a good sermon. When you got a good sermon, you preach it and you preach it and you preach it. You preach it in every location. Uh, you just preach it until you get to a location where they've already heard it before and then you go to your second sermon. Uh, but that's such a good sermon, he probably preached it over and over and over again. And Matthew was sitting there taking notes as Jesus was preaching that sermon. And it's very, very possible that that is how it came about. But he would have done that in the Aramaic or Hebrew. And then Matthew, being a tax collector and an educated person, would have known the Greek and known it well. And so he simply then takes it and translates it to Greek. Um, so the fact is that we do not have a Hebrew gospel of Matthew. And so that's conjecture to say that it was actually written in Hebrew. That's based on Papias and, and Irenaeus, but there's not been a, a Hebrew a manuscript of the gospel of Matthew that's been found. Uh, we, all the manuscripts that we have are in Greek. The date and the place, many scholars place Matthew's date between 80 and 100. They place it after the destruction of the temple. But that's mostly because they don't believe in predictive prophecy. That Matthew could not have written about the destruction of the temple, destruction of Jerusalem, before it happened. But if you believe in predictive prophecy, there's no reason to date Matthew's gospel late. Merrill Tenney dates it between 50 and 70. Uh, Harrison dates it in 70. Thiessen in 50. Me <laughs> in 68. So close to 70. Uh, that's where I would put Luke and Matthew, somewhere close to to 70. I believe that uh, as the gospel um, was written that people would have read the gospel, they would have paid attention to the warning signs and actually gotten out of Jerusalem 
when they saw the signs that were going on in Matthew chapter 24. And they would have escaped across the Jordan. And early uh, church history and archaeology also uh, shows us that the disciples believed the prediction of Jesus. And many of them got out of town before the Romans came. And they set up communities on the eastern side of the Jordan. And uh, archaeologists have found those communities where the disciples went and they lived. And they escaped the destruction of Jerusalem uh, because they, they believed Jesus. Because they had faith in Jesus and trusted his word. And uh, I think that's interesting that they did that. The place, the traditional place where it's written from is Palestine. Jerome confirms this, but he's kind of late. Uh, but he says that it was written in Palestine. B.H. Streeter and Merrill Tenney both say that pro probably it was written from Antioch. Um, and some say across the Jordan. So east of the Jordan where there would have been that early community of disciples that escaped the destruction of the temple and went across the Jordan River. But in this case... Unlike the letters of Paul, where the place where it's written from and the place that it's written to is very, very important, it's not so much with the Gospels, because with the Gospels, you're just getting really a picture of Jesus. Uh, it is important to pay attention to some of the titles in the Gospels, because they tell us the audience and, and the theme and what the writer's trying to express. In this case, a Jewish audience, because, uh, for example, uh, Matthew uses kingdom of heaven all the time, not all the time, but mostly instead of kingdom of God. And there's a reason for that. It's because in, in Judaism, you wouldn't say kingdom of God. You wouldn't say God. In fact, when they write the word God, they put God, G hyphen D. And that's true even today in Hasidic communities. And so instead of saying kingdom of God, Matthew makes it uh, easier for them to read and to understand by just switching that to kingdom of heaven. And so that's sort of a key that he's writing to a Jewish audience, a Hebrew audience, instead of a Gentile audience. And so you look at the audience, probably Jewish Christians, probably in the second half of the first century, as they're about to undergo some persecution, but also they're um, interested in who Jesus was. And so Matthew writes to them, telling them who Jesus is, and really emphasizing that Jesus is the Christ, he is the Messiah which is a big, big emphasis in the Gospel of Matthew. And so he uses many Hebrew phrases and does not translate them. Whereas Luke and Mark would take a Hebrew phrase and then they, they would translate it to say, this is what it means. Uh, Matthew doesn't do that all the time. He just leaves it standing there. And um, he uses, as I mentioned, kingdom of heaven, which is a very Semitic way of talking about the kingdom of God. Why write this Gospel? Um, my feeling is he had the Gospel of Mark in his hand, and he thought, you know, this is great. It tells the basic outline of the life of Jesus, but it's, there's some gaps here. Uh, what about a Jewish audience? They're not going to receive this as well as they could if some of these, um, some of these phrases, like kingdom of God, uh, were put a little differently. Or ta instead of talking about son of God, let's talk about Christos. Let's talk about Messiah. And uh, so he writes and he emphasizes that. And so I think that's one of the reasons is an apologetic to convince the Jewish readers that Jesus truly is the Messiah. Uh, also, he uh, talks about the church here. The church is the true Israel. And so, you know, in, in the Jewish mind, well, what's going to happen with Israel? Especially as the temple is about to be destroyed. What's going to happen with Israel? Well, it will live on in the church. And he also talks about righteousness quite often. And righteousness is a very uh, Jewish Hebrew term, this idea of doing right acts, this idea of the didache and diakios, which is righteousness and righteous. Those are a very Semitic Jewish way of talking about things. And righteousness and faith go hand in hand in the Gospel of Matthew. And Matthew also likes to emphasize the discourse sections. You know, there when you look at Mark, there aren't these long discourses of Jesus, not a lot of sayings of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. But Matthew really changes that up. In Matthew, there are five major discourse sections. Of course, the most famous of all is the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7. But you get there and there's nothing like Matthew 5 through 7 in the Gospel of Mark. But that's, that's something that Matthew is adding to his Gospel. He wants the sayings of Jesus the teachings of Jesus to ring 
to ring loud, to ring clear. He really wants people to hear the voice of Jesus in his gospel. So you might say, as Mark put a face on Jesus, Matthew puts a voice to Jesus and really emphasizes his teachings. And just uh, you see this especially in the first section, 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, the next, next discord section, which is chapter 10, and then the next uh, section, which is chapter 13, and then 18, and then another really long one at the end, 23 through 25, you get this beautiful story, one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible of the judgment scene in Matthew 25 and the separating of the sheep and the goats. But even before that, you have a whole chapter, Matthew 24, where it's talking about the, the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, a little bit there about the end of time, and uh, there's a whole discourse section there. Chapter 23, the woes section. Woe to you, woe to you, Pharisees. Woe to you, blind guides. And so you have 23, 24, 25, the discourse section of Jesus there, and it's really, really great material there uh, in those sections. But you also notice how it's broken up. You have basically the beginning, chapters 1 and 2, great birth emphasis story that Matthew has there, which you don't have in Mark. Matthew and Luke both include birth emphasis stories, and both of them emphasize something different in their birth infancy stories. Uh, so they're telling the story a little differently, uh, one for a Jewish audience and one for a Gentile audience. Luke more for the Gentile audience. And so even the way they talk about the birth of Jesus is different based on the audience that they're writing. But Mark doesn't have that. And so Matthew and Luke in both include that in their Gospels. And you see that there's that introduction in, in, in Matthew. We'll get to that in just a moment. With the uh, genealogy, both Matthew and Luke include, include genealogies, and Mark doesn't. So they're adding some great, great material here to Mark's basic structure and Mark's basic outline. But then you get into this... Uh, this um, Narrative 3 and 4, Discourse 5 through 7, first on discipleship, and then it follows, this, this same structure follows all the way through chapter 25, and then you get to the story of the telling of the cross. Okay, So you get to the passion narrative, the, the cross story. So it begins with an introduction, ends with the cross story, but between there, you have five sections. Uh, narrative and discourse material. One on discipleship, one on apostleship, one on the hiding of the revelation, uh, the Messianic secret, then church administration, and then the judgment, the judgment scene there. And so B.W. Uh, B. Bacon was the first to say that what Matthew is doing is he's here giving the five books of Jesus, just as in, in the Hebrew religion, you have the five books of Moses. Why? Because Jesus is the new Moses. Moses was the great lawgiver. Moses was the great person that, that spoke the word of God and gave the revelation of God and showed people who God was. And now you have entering the world the new Moses. Nice. The new Moses who gives you now these five scrolls, these five books for you to understand. And it might very well be that in the Jewish mind as they're looking at this, because in the Jewish mind, especially in that setting, they paid attention to numbers. And this might have been something that would jump off the page at them. But this is something that, uh, that you can look at and say, well, e even if it's not there, Jesus definitely was saying, or, or uh, M Matthew was definitely saying that Jesus is a great lawgiver like Moses and a great spokesperson uh, like Moses. Okay? Now, characteristics, uh, some basic characteristics. Matthew is concise, not like Mark in the way that Mark was, but you can see from his structure that he's very structured and concise in his structure. He's very, very messianic in his approach to the text. And let me just show you here, uh, if you'll open up to Matthew chapter 1, then I'll show you here an example of how Matthew is messianic in his approach. Okay, see Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And so you have Christ there. Jesus Christos, Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Who came first? 
Abraham. Matthew switches it up. This is a genealogy. You shouldn't do that. Okay, you should tell them in order. But he switches it up on purpose because he wants to emphasize Jesus is the Messiah. So he mentions Messiah first. Son of David, son of Abraham. You go down to verse 6. And Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon. He mentions David twice there. The only place here that, that he does that is mention David, David. He doesn't do it for Abraham, Abraham. doesn't do it any other place. But David, David. King David, David. And so you see that emphasis there that he's making as he builds this genealogy. And then at the very end of it all, he summarizes it in verse 16, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ, Christos, Messiah. He is the Messiah. So Jesus is Christos. He is the Messiah. And then in verse 17, thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. And that's just sort of the final stamp there. And he doesn't say 14 to Jesus. He says 14 to the Christ. But look at that. He says David, David, Christ. And so he got that repetition in the middle, and now the repetition at the end. He begins with David, he ends with David, and the whole focus is he's the son of David, he is king. This is King Jesus that we're talking about here. So Matthew's like, please, at the very beginning, understand what I'm saying. Jesus is the king. He is the Messiah. And then throughout his gospel, he emphasizes that, that idea of, of kingship. He ties in his, um, his material very much for the Hebrew mind with the scriptures. Uh, one, one of the phrases that he uses over and over again is as it was written, and then he quotes scripture. And you'll see this, quoting the Old Testament over and over again to emphasize uh, to the Hebrew mind that this is the fulfillment of prophecy. When you're reading about Jesus here, you're reading about the Son of God, the Son of David, the Messiah, the fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, Matthew is universal in the sense that he does include Gentiles into his message. And you see that through different stories and uh, reaching out in different times, going outside of Israel to talk to people. But you also see it at the very end of the gospel with the Great Commission. It's ecclesiastical. That's just a, a fancy way of saying church. Uh, because he uses the word church in Matthew 16. The only time the word church is used in all four of the Gospels is found in the book of Matthew. Wow. Matthew uses 90% of Mark, which makes up about 50% of his Gospel. And again, I, that's why I felt like Mark was written first, and then 90% of that comes uh, is, is what Matthew borrows. 27% of Matthew is Q material, that saying material, discourse material, that's also used by Luke. So Luke and Matthew use some of the same sayings of Jesus, and uh, that's called Q, which is in, from the German word quell, which is source. So the source material, the saying material, is used by Matthew and Luke. 27% of that makes up Matthew. 22% of Matthew is his own material. Over 60 direct quotes from the Old Testament. Why? He's, he's tying in the Old Testament to Jesus because he's writing to a Jewish audience. And so he uses the Old Testament over and over again to substantiate who Jesus is to them uh, as, and, and really to demonstrate that he is the Messiah. It's didactic. It emphasizes Jesus as teacher. And you see Jesus as a great teacher uh, in the book. Some of the major themes that you'll read in the Gospel of Matthew. As I mentioned before, Jesus, son of David, son of Abraham. It's messianic in tone. It is written, is a saying that's used over and over again, fulfillment of prophecy. These are major themes. Jesus is the son of David. Uh, Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy because he's writing to this Hebrew audience. A kingdom of heaven appears 32 times. And it's not kingdom of God as it is in the other gospels. It's kingdom of heaven. The, that kingdom means the rule and reign of God. And the rule and reign of God actually appears in the person of Jesus. So Jesus is king, even while he's present on the earth, giving his kingdom to people. Then, then also a central teaching in the gospel is discipleship and love. Love is central to discipleship. 
So as whereas Mark would talk about discipleship with suffering, Matthew would tie discipleship more into righteous acts and following Jesus and love. And so it's a little different emphasis there on what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Uh, one of my favorite commentaries on Matthew is by D.A. Carson. It's actually a two-volume commentary on Matthew, and I think if you get it and pick it up, you'll really like it. It's uh, the Expositor's Bible Commentary is, the, is what it comes from. Okay, let's look at the teaching section here. Obviously, there's a lot of things that we could look at. We don't have a lot of time, and so um, it would be great for us to be able to read through the Sermon on the Mount. I we wish we had time to do that. We don't have time to do it, but let's at least read through the Beatitudes and, uh, and look at that, and then we'll look at maybe one or two other things in the Gospel of Matthew. Okay, you guys with me? Yes. Now we've gone from some of the introductory material to now looking at some of the text of Matthew itself. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed, that word can also be translated as happy. Happy are, blessed are. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What Jesus is teaching here is very counter intuitive and it's countercultural as well which is who jesus was that's the type of teacher that he was uh, so blessed are those who are poor in spirit for theirs is kingdom of heaven you see that phrase there kingdom of heaven blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth it's the opposite of what the world says the world says if you want to inherit the world then you have to go and take it you had to stomp on people and walk on people. But that's not what Jesus teaches. Blessed are those who are meek. But meekness is not weakness. He doesn't say blessed are the weak. Meekness is actually power, but it's power under control. I mean, Jesus was meek. He was meek and lowly in spirit, but he was powerful. And so powerful that at a word, you could hold people at bay. So powerful when they wanted to throw him off the cliff, he just stops them and walks through their midst. So powerful that he cleansed the temple. And when he's cleansing the temple, he's not just dealing with the religious hierarchy there, he's dealing with a bunch of thugs also. I mean, that's who he's dealing with. These guys are out to rob people, to steal people, to take whatever they can, mostly from the poor, uh, because the wealthy, it doesn't matter anyway. And they're bringing their own money. They don't need to, their money exchanged. And, they're, 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 they can afford to buy a sacrifice, but the poor, they were confiscating, confiscating their sacrifices, turning around and reselling them all over again, making them buy one at the temple site for a higher price, and then charging them exorbitant rates on their exchange of money. It, it, it was really, a, a, they, were, they were living off of the poor and mistreating and abusing the poor. And so Jesus takes a stand there. But you see the power in this taking the stand there and, and it was a, it was a statement it was a statement of, of justice and standing up for what was right and making sure that the temple was going to be a temple of prayer um, but jesus was strong and powerful so when he says blessed are the meek he's not saying blessed are the weak no meekness is power under control they will inherit the earth blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and again that's a very jewish term there Righteousness, righteous acts, doing the right thing, making the right decision. You have to have a hunger and thirst for that. And when you hunger and thirst for that, you will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And Jesus over and over again in his Gospels emphasizes this idea of showing mercy, of showing forgiveness. You want to be forgiven, you have to be willing to forgive yourself. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. I love this one here. Uh, the pure in heart. I'm not just talking about uh, purity in the sense of, um, of, of controlling lust, but purity really in the, in the mind of, of Jesus. And even when you look up the word in the, in the original and study it out, it's more of a solitary focus on nothing but God. That's purity. So yeah, that would include lust, you know, controlling lust in your life. But it's much bigger than that, much more than that. Uh, the idea is, is that blessed are those who are focused totally on God. 
for they will see God. But the fact is, that's the only way you're going to see God. Because if you bring anything else into focus, God comes out of focus. But if you're focused solely on God, and he's, that's your single-minded focus that's on God, then God will stay in focus. So keep the distractions out. Purity of heart means that we're getting rid of the distractions that would take us away from following God. And we're focusing in and zeroing in on God and God alone, and then we really see Him. But when there's a distraction in your life, you're never going to really, really see Him. Not as He really is. Because that distraction is going to pull Him out of focus. So blessed are those who are single-minded in heart, single-minded in focus of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. And again, peacemakers, we usually think of peace as um, the absence of violence. The peace in the Hebrew, and that's what Matthew is speaking to. He's speaking to a Hebrew audience, might have even written this in Hebrew. And if he's writing it in Hebrew, he's using the word shalom. And shalom in the Hebrew, it's not just, hey, how you doing? It is that. You know, it's hello and it's goodbye. You say shalom to greet someone. You say, you say shalom to say goodbye to someone. If you're in the South, you say shalom, y'all. <laughs> but that's, it means more than that. Shalom in the Hebrew, it actually means, it means wholeness. Wholeness. And when you're greeting someone using the word shalom, you're saying, I want you to have a whole life. W-H-O-L-E. Wholeness. I want your life to be complete. Thoroughly whole, thoroughly complete. And so here, you know, blessed are those who give wholeness to other people. Make people whole. Complete people's lives. You know, I, I always think of this, you know, when I think of, of arguments. Because it's not the person that wins the argument that wins. It's the person that makes peace that wins. And it's the person that brings wholeness to people. That's the person that Jesus is talking about here. So blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God, sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So the Sermon on the Mount, beginning with the Beatitudes, it's amazing. Let's look over in Matthew chapter 22. My, one of my favorite passages in the Gospel of Matthew. And I think also one of the passages that we need to pay attention to, we need to preach about, talk about time and time again. It's, um, it's just one of these passages that by itself, even in context, it says, read me, pay attention to me, I am important. And I'll show you why I feel that way as we read it here. Um, and I, I do feel like it's, it's a passage that if you haven't taught on this in a while, you should come back to it regularly. We all just need to hear this passage quite often. Uh, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, that would have been a scribe, tested him with this question, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And that was a really important question for the scribes. They went around and they asked a lot of rabbis that question. And rabbis had different answers about what is the most important teaching in the law. And you might be aware that in New Testament times, there were two major rabbis that sort of led up to Jesus. Um, there was Hillel and there was Shammai. And uh, the, these guys had different, different takes on different rulings. Uh, and, and you can read about divorce and remarriage, for example. And Hillel was, was more liberal in his take on divorce and remarry, remarriage and who could divorce and who could remarry. Shammai was more conservative in his approach. Well, this one rabbi he comes up to Shammai and he asks him this question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? So in the Torah, what's the most important? And this is called, in the Hebrew, it's called halakha. It's like when you're teaching on one of the teachings of the law. And so Shammai is going to give his halakha, and it also goes with the word walking, walking with the text. And so he's going to give his rendition of, okay, what does it mean to, uh, what is the greatest commandment in all the law? But Shammai, instead of giving him a direct answer, he actually takes his sandal off, and he starts hitting the guy across the head. And he says, that's a stupid question. You don't ask that question. 
Like they're all important. All 613 are so important. You can't just boil it down to one. And so he agrees with me. There are stupid questions. <laughs> Amen. Uh, but I won't hit you over the head if you ask one. Uh, but it's, it was an important question in the first century. So he asked Jesus, Jesus, what is the most important of all the commands? But Jesus does answer. He says, love the Lord your God. Love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And of course, Mark adds strength. So basically with everything you got, all of it. So heart, soul, mind, strength, everything you have, love God. That's the most important thing. And that's the one thing, if you're gonna trim it down to one thing, love, love God. And I think that's really important for us because sometimes you don't know what to do in life. You know, sometimes you don't know the proper response. I come across people sometimes and maybe they're angry or maybe they're sad or maybe they're just confused and I don't know exactly what to say and I don't know exactly what to, 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 how to answer them but I know that there's always one thing that I can do and that's love. Love God. And then they didn't even ask for a second but Jesus gives this one. He just adds it on. And he's like, okay, I'm giving you this for free right here, okay? That's the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. And he gives them this one, I believe, because if you're going to love God, then you have to do this one. Right. You can't claim to love God and then ignore this one, which is what many, let's face it, some of the rabbis were doing that. They weren't treating people right. And so Jesus says, love God with everything you have. That's the first. That's the greatest. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets, which is basically the whole Old Testament as we look at it today. It's the Torah, it's the Nevaim, it's the Kitabim, it's the whole thing. Everything hangs on that. Loving God and loving people. And it's not just that the whole Old Testament hangs on it, the New Testament and discipleship and who we are following Jesus today hangs on it as well. Love God, love people. If you can walk away from these, these days together with one thing ring, ringing in your ears, ringing in your mind, let it be this verse. Love God, love people. If you want to know the essential of the ministry and what it means to be in the ministry, what it means to be a minister of God, also just what it means to be a disciple and a follower of Christ, love God, love people. Well, that's the kernel. So everything else is based from that. That's right. Love God, love people. And so I love this passage. We need to keep coming back to it over and over and over again. Another great passage, I don't have time to even go through it. There's two more I, I would love for you to focus on. Matthew 25, the judgment scene. When I was in a seminary, my professor called this the Mount Everest of the New Testament. He thought this was the pinnacle. This was the peak, the peak of the New Testament. How we treat people, uh, how we take care of people, how we love people. It's a perfect illustration of that second commandment, love others, uh, here in Matthew chapter 25. Wish we had time to talk about it. And then Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the Great Commission. Uh, but we have to go on to Luke. And so let's look at the Gospel of Luke. So Matthew 25, great passage right there. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did for me. That was really the saying that, that drove Mother Teresa and all that she did to help the poor. Mother Teresa said with, when she looked in the eyes of the poor, she saw the eyes of Jesus. And I think that's a great thing for us to remember too. Not just the eyes of the poor, but in everyone's eyes. When you look in the eyes of anyone, see the eyes of Jesus and treat them as if you were treating Jesus. Okay, Matthew 28 was the other one. Now let's look at Luke a little bit here. And again, I apologize that we have to go through this so quickly, but it's the nature of the way the class is set up. And uh, maybe at some point we'll be able to go back and spend more time, because all of these deserve way more time uh, than we're giving them. Luke is an amazing gospel. You know, I, I love all these gospels. One of the reasons I do love Luke is because he emphasizes the poor uh, throughout his gospel. It's a major theme. Luke talks about the poor more than any other of the gospels. Luke talks about women. 
more than any other of the gospel writers. And so, amen for Luke. Yeah, he, Luke was a good guy. And uh, when you look at Luke, there's just some great themes that you see, see in Luke. And um, Luke approaches it uh, more, maybe not more, but Luke comes into writing the Gospels and he really writes it from a literary point of view. I mean, the, the Greek in Luke is amazing. The way he tells the stories are amazing. He looks at it more as a historian than the, and just states that, that this is the way I'm looking at it in this way. Uh, and so when you see, when, when you look at Luke, you're looking at someone who really took time with the manuscript trying to make it exactly the way he wanted it to look. Again, the authorship, it's, Luke isn't mentioned as the author, so we have to go to the first century uh, uh, church fathers. Uh, one of the heretics, Marcion, in the mid-second century said that Luke was the author of, um, of this gospel, the Moratorian Canon, which was one of the first canons that was formed, uh, containing many of the books of the New Testament and a few that we don't include in our New Testament. But the Muratorian Canon places Luke as the author. Carson and Moose say this in their New Testament survey, which is the one of the ones that you can read if you wish. The universal identification of a non-apostle as the author of almost one quarter of the New Testament speaks strongly for the authenticity of the tradition. Now what he means by that is, if you're going to pick somebody to author one fourth of the New Testament, you should pick Peter, or you should pick Matthew, or you should pick John, one of the apostles, but the fact that Luke was not even an apostle and, and his name is associated with these books, that's actually a good testimony because he's not the person that you would naturally choose. Yep. So he was probably, you know, probably is authentic that he wrote these uh, books, Luke and Acts. So he wrote two volumes. Luke is the gospel. Acts is the history of the early church. And um, maybe the reason that he wrote two volumes instead of one is simply because he, the, the scrolls only went to a certain size. And so he finished Luke, and he was at the end of that scroll, and he says, let me start another scroll here. And he has, so he has Acts as a second volume there. As we know, he was a physician, and he was a historian. He was a very educated person, good writer, strong Greek vocabulary, strong Greek style, the only non-Jewish writer of the New Testament. We're not taking a final exam for this class, but if we were, that would be on the exam. Okay? <laughs> was the only non-Jewish writer of the, of the Gospels, for sure, probably of the New Testament. We're not sure about the Hebrew writer, um, but uh, the Hebrews being the title Hebrew is probably uh, Jewish. So the only non-Jewish Gentile writer of the New Testament. Not an eyewitness of Jesus, but an investigator. Look over in Luke chapter 1. I love the way that Luke begins his Gospel. And he just starts out by telling, I, I've looked at this, I've researched this, I've studied this out. And so you've got Mark's gospel probably in existence, and then Luke takes that and says, wow, what a great idea. Now let me research it even deeper. Okay, and let me ask some good questions of people and see what I could find out about this. And writing as a Gentile to a Gentile audience, Matthew's gospel to a, to a Jewish audience. Many have undertaken to draw up the account the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seems good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. He's writing, investigating these things, and making sure that uh, he has explored them, he's researched them, but he's also writing for a purpose here, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. It's an apologetic that he's writing here. He wants to defend the faith. He wants them to understand that what they are believing, that, that, that it's good, it, it's, it's based on good evidence. There's strong support for this. And so that's why Luke writes this gospel and what he puts into the gospel. The date and the place, uh, sometime after Mark, so if you, dart, if you date Mark in the early uh, 60s, then you date Luke in the late 60s. I give Luke and date basically the same dating sometime around 67, 68, shortly before the destruction of the Jerusalem of Jerusalem in AD 70. Some would date it earlier. There's no reason not to. And you could date all of these much earlier. I mean, you could all, date all of these into the 50s or even into the 40s. And some like John Robinson have done that. Um, but Tenney writes, it must have been written before Acts 
Acts was probably composed prior to the close of Paul's first imprisonment in Rome. Since the abrupt ending of the book intimates that the author has no more to say, perhaps AD 60 would serve as a good median date, for by that time Luke would have been a Christian for at least 10 years or more, would have traveled in Palestine where he could have met many of those who had known Jesus in the flesh. Uh, so sometime around that time before the destruction of the temple, you could put that as the date uh, and the place there. Well, here's the place unknown, we're not sure. Probably outside of Palestine, perhaps Rome, perhaps Antioch. But uh, again, with the Gospels, the exact place of origin isn't as important as it is in some of the letters that we're going to look at later. The audience is simply addressed as is Acts to Theophilus. Theophilus is a word that means lover of God or friend of God. As you know, there's different words for love in the Greek, and this is the word for love, uh, phileo, based on that verb, which means friend. So loving as a friend, a friend of God. Uh, and some say that this might have been a person, it might have been a patron who supported Luke in his travels, supported Luke in writing this and the book of Acts. Uh, or it might have just been a general, uh, general uh, type of uh, salutation to anyone who's a lover of God. If, if you love God, this is for you. Um, but we're not sure. But definitely written to Gentiles more than Jews and especially to those in and around Rome, that seems to be the audience. The purpose, I just read that, so I'm not going to read it again, but you see the purpose there, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. We don't have to wonder about the purpose of the Gospel of Luke. He just states it for us, tells us exactly from the very beginning why he's writing this. So it was to attract and win cultured citizens of the, Jew, of the Gentile world. It was to give a picture of God's saving work in the world. Luke talks quite a bit about salvation and redemption in his gospel, does that more than the other gospels, and possibly to give Theophilus enough material to decide whether he wanted to be a Christian instead of just a God-fearer, uh, and Theophilus could have known the certainty of his faith by reading the gospel of Luke. A few characteristics about Luke's gospel, it is um, comprehensive, it's the longest book in the New Testament, even though it's not by chapter, by words it is by just the length of the material it's the longest book in the new testament another great exam question so sad we're not taking an exam at the end of all of this makes up 27 percent of the new testament uh, it is universal in its approach it definitely opens up the gospel to the gentile world and accepts gentiles and jews into the salvation of jesus it's very people-oriented. As I mentioned before, there's more, more focus on women in the Gospel of Luke than in any of the other Gospels. Uh, prayer is a very significant theme in the Gospel of Luke and also the Holy Spirit. We usually associate the Holy Spirit with the book of Acts and certainly as we look at Acts, we'll see that the Holy Spirit is on every page of the book of Acts. In fact, another great title for the book of Acts, instead of calling it the Acts of the Apostles, you could call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit because that title actually isn't on the manuscript. And so the title was made up anyway. But it's more, instead of the apostles making up the direction of where they're going and where they're going to move next and what's going to happen next, it's the Holy Spirit that's doing all the directing in both these works. So Luke emphasizes the Holy Spirit very much in both of his books. And Luke uses 60% of Mark, whereas Matthew used 90. Uh, he uses 60%, makes up 40% of his gospel. Cue that common source of sayings between Matthew and Luke. Uh, Luke uses, it makes up 20% of the Gospel of Luke, where he's in common with Matthew in the saying source. And then Luke's material on his own, 40% of his Gospel there, is his own material that he pulls in. Uh, and some of those are parables, and some of those are um, different narratives in, in the message of Jesus. So that's some of the characteristics. It is historical. And as I've mentioned before, it's literary in the sense that the Greek that's used is really very high quality Greek in the Gospel of Luke. Some of the themes that you'll see here, and we can actually you could go to some of these verses and look at them. Prayer, Luke 11, 1 through 12. Holy Spirit, chapter 1, verse 1, angel says to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you some, from the very beginning the Holy Spirit is involved 
in the Gospel of Luke. The Gentiles in chapter 3, verse 38. Notice Luke in his genealogy. He doesn't say son of David, son of Abraham. He goes all the way back to, to the son of Adam, the son of God. He traces it all the way back to the very beginning. That's universal. That includes everyone. He just doesn't start with David or start with Abraham. It goes before that. So you see the universal appeal of that, especially for a Gentile audience. You also see the title, Son of God. That would have rung true for a Gentile audience. Son of Man, they wouldn't have understood that. Son of David, not really. Son of God, they understood the gods. And they understood what a son of the gods was. Because that was their pantheon. Okay, that was their world. That's how they were living. And so he is not, you know, just the son of the gods, little g. He is the son of the God. That's who this Jesus is. And he presents him to the Gentile world as that. So Luke is really writing with his audience in mind, trying to connect them to who Jesus was, going all the way back to the beginning, to Adam, and talking about him being the son of God. He, as I mentioned, it's the gospel of the poor. If you want to do a great study on poor, the poor in the Bible, or Jesus and his reaction to the poor, his treatment of the poor, you, you just really, all you need to do is focus on Luke. Luke is just a great gospel to study out treatment of the poor, the heart of the poor, or the heart of Jesus toward the poor. And I would invite you to do that. Uh, Jesus also mentioned a, a Savior. A Savior has been born. Again, in the, in the Gentile mind, um, they wouldn't have understood Messiah so much. They wouldn't have gotten that. But Savior, they get that. They, they understand that concept. Even the way that they looked at their Caesars. Their Caesars were saviors to them. And ultimately the Caesars became divine in their mind. And so they, understand, they would understand that concept of redemption, of buying back, uh, and, and the idea of savior. And that's who Jesus, that's how he's presented here by Luke. And then universal again, salvation is for all people. Luke 7, 1 through 10, and other stories. I just am mentioning a few here. But Luke 7, the centurion. Salvation is for those outside of Israel. Centurion, that's about as Roman as you're going to get. A Roman soldier. And yet, you see his reaction to Jesus and Jesus' reaction to him. Discipleship, he sends out the 12. He sends out the 70. He challenges excuses. There's the counting of the cost in, in Luke 12 as well as Luke 14 that I have here. Discipleship is a major theme uh, in the Gospel of Luke. A couple of commentaries that, that I like. Uh, one is by Daryl Bach. Daryl L. Bach. It's in the uh, NIV application commentary. And that's a very good commentary. Another one, I mentioned this guy's name before, Robert H. Stein, uh, in the New American Commentary. Just another word about commentaries right here. Uh, sometimes people say, well, what's the best set of commentaries to get? Uh, honestly, there is no best set of commentaries to get. The best way to build a library of commentaries is to look at some people that you like to read that are really good with their specialties. Because the fact is, in scholarship, Scholars have specialties that they then do their work in. And so if you're going to uh, the Gospels, then you need to look at somebody that specializes in the Gospels. And uh, like a D.A. Carson, for example, and his commentary on Matthew. But then if we were to go to uh, Ephesians or some of the, the letters of Paul, then it'd be better to get a Pauline scholar and read their commentary on that. And so uh, it's difficult to say that this is a great set. I mentioned, the, uh, I mentioned N.T. Wright's set and Barclay's set. I'm not saying that they're great sets. I'm saying that they're easy to read. <laughs> but if you want to do scholarly work or academic work, that, neither of those is the place to go because you're not going to get academic. They're not academic commentaries. Okay? And so you have to spend a little time looking around and asking. And if you'll get a list of some of the ones I'm giving here throughout the course, then you'll have a list of some good commentaries that you can go back and begin to build a library uh, based on some of these different commentaries. Let's look at one story from Luke. It's a shame again. That we can only pick out one or two verses here to focus in on. But I wanted, because of the emphasis on the poor in the Gospel of Luke, I wanted to look at, look at one of my favorite stories 
not just in Luke, but in the whole Bible, and it's the story of the Good Samaritan. So if you go to Luke chapter 10, man, let's look down here in verse 25. Are you guys with me? I know it's been a long day for some of you. Some of you have driven long distances to get here, and I appreciate you staying up late with me, even later than we planned on being here. Uh, This is a a great parable here. It's a parable that's just a beautiful narrative, and uh, it's the kind of thing that can be acted out uh, real easily. One of the reasons I love this story is because I've actually been on the Jericho Road. Uh, My family had the opportunity uh, to live in Jerusalem for almost a year, and uh, my daughter Chelsea was, I believe, seven at the time, and my son Daniel, I believe, was five at the time. And I can remember going to the Jericho Road And we took a couple of friends with us, and we acted out the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, And that that was quite the family devotional, you know, (laughs) when you can actually go and act out the story of the Good Samaritan on the Jericho Way. Uh, Another favorite devotional we did was uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. We got to know the gatekeeper to the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, we actually, every time we showed up, he, did, he, he usually didn't let people in, and, and that was just who he was. But, you know, I would bring him coffee and bread and that kind of thing and, and got to know him. And uh, so every time I would come, he would open up the gate, and we could have devotionals as long as we wanted to, you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Chelsea actually had her favorite tree in the Garden of Gethsemane that she would climb up in, which is totally not allowed, okay? <laughs> You're not supposed to be climbing the trees in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, but uh, because he liked us and liked our kids, uh, she had the tree that she climbed up in in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, so hopefully all of you at some point will get to take a trip to the Holy Land. Uh, if you've been there, you know there's, there's absolutely nothing like it. If you're going to spend a year there, that's really awesome, okay? But even if you spend a week, 10 days there, uh, what, what happens is, is that you come out of it really uh, visualizing the Bible like you never have before. Uh, when people say the Garden of Gethsemane, you can actually picture it in your mind because you've been there. Uh, or the Southern Temple Steps, or Capernaum, or the Sea of Galilee. It's just all right there in your memory. And so... Jacoby and I are taking a tour this fall. We're also taking one in the summer of 2017. And so if you can save up the funds and get there, uh, I make no money on it, okay? So I'm not advertising to get you to come spend your money. So I'll, now Jacoby makes money on it, okay? Oh. <laughs> I know. I'll have to edit that out. Sorry, Douglas. Um, but I make no money on the trip. I just want to be clear about that, okay? Now, where were we? Oh, the sermon, the the Good Samaritan. Here we go. Verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law, another one of these scribes, who really knew the law inside out, and not only did they know the law, they knew what all the rabbis said about the law. That was the nature of a scribe. A scribe, his job was, uh, they were very educated, they were very smart, they knew multiple languages because many of the people couldn't read and they couldn't write. And so they would actually go to a scribe to to write out their letters for them. So if there were any legal documents that needed to be done, any letters that were being sent uh, to Rome, if they received a letter that was written in another language, they would go to a scribe and the scribe would read it for them. The scribe would then write out an answer to the letter and that's how the scribe made their money, was doing that type of thing. What we would think of as a lawyer today, but they were very smart and very educated, knew many, many languages, knew the law inside out. I'm talking about not just the 613 commands in the Old Testament, but what all the rabbis had to say about them. And this is what a rabbi would do. You go to a rabbi for a ruling on something, and a rabbi would, would basically, he would think about it for a minute, and he would say, well, this is what, this is what Gamaliel said. This is what Hillel said, and he would quote them verbatim. They'd have it all up here. And this is what Shammai says, and this is what I say. Uh, and usually they would say it. They would say, amen, I say this. And you notice Jesus, when he makes his amen statements in the Bible, he usually says, amen, amen. Verily, verily. Because he's just giving that little extra emphasis. You know, you've heard this, this is what was said, but this is what amen, amen, I say. And it's like, Kaboom, drop the mic. That's what Jesus is doing when he does that. And so, and notice he also, he doesn't quote other rabbis. 
when he says it. When they come and they ask him, they're asking for a rabbinic uh, saying on this, a rabbinic answer on this. But Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't say, Shammai says this, Hillel says this. He just says, I say to you. Amen, amen, I say to you. Come on. Drop the mic. Yeah, okay. So on one occasion, this, this scribe, this expert in the law, says, Teacher, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, and this is such a beautiful story here. A man was going down from Jericho to, uh, from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. So he's doing this descent down to Jericho. Jerusalem is 200 and, I'm sorry, 2,500 feet above sea level. It literally is a city set on a hill. Okay? Jericho is around 1,300 feet below sea level. It is the lowest point on the earth. And it is the lowest city on earth where anyone lives okay it's just that's Jericho it's right down there by the Dead Sea and so he's descending and going from Jerusalem down to Jericho it's a narrow path it's a path that uh, people people knew not to travel that path by themselves it was a dangerous course that he was taking but he's going down there when he fell into the hands of robbers they stripped him with his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down from the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So the priest, he goes, and he sees, and he sees the person that's hurt, and he just, instead of going up to him, he goes around him. There might have, you know, in his mind, he might have been thinking, I'm a priest. Here's blood. I touch this, I become unclean. I won't be able to help anybody else because I will be ceremonially unclean. I'll have to spend all these next, this next week making myself clean again. And so I'm just not going to bother here. Okay? A Levite also, when he comes to the place, he saw him and he passed by on the other side. So the Levite, the same thing. He sees it, but in his mind, he's probably thinking, I, you know, I, I, that person does not look like he's of the tribe of Levi. He doesn't look like he's an Israelite. And so my obligation really is to the people of Israel. I'm a Levite. And so he can justify in his own mind why he's not helping this person that's lying there bloody and, and beaten. And so he passes by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he's traveling, came where the man was, and when he saw him, took pity on him. And so, you know, you have different people, and in their minds they could be giving different excuses. The Levite maybe not recognizing where the guy's from. The priest may be thinking that he's um, going to become unclean. And the Samaritan, if anybody had an excuse, it was him. He's walking by. He came where the man was. And when he saw him, instead of thinking of excuses, he had pity. And that's the difference. He didn't think of excuses. He had pity. His heart went out to the person. It says, he went to him, he bandaged his wounds, he poured on oil and wine, and he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, took care of him. He not only, you know, bandages him, he goes the extra mile, which is what Jesus was always teaching. The next day, I mean, there's not just one day involved in this. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Looking after him, he said, when I return, I will have extra expense you may have. So he's even willing to take care of the man uh, on down the road. Which of these three do you think the neighbor was uh, to the man who fell into the hand of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. And that last phrase, go and do likewise, that's just the one that rings out and keeps on ringing. Because for all of us, we have the opportunity to show mercy to people and for our hearts to go out to people and to help. And Jesus is asking us to reach out and to help whenever we have the opportunity to be able to help people around us. And so one of the reasons I love the Gospel of Luke is because it has this emphasis throughout his Gospel. Uh, and Jesus really is the 
son of God in the gospel, but he's a son of God who has a heart for those who are poor and unfortunate and not as well off. That's, that's the heart of Jesus. And thus should be our heart uh, today because we are disciples of Jesus. Amen.